Hello. Hi. <laughs> it is so nice to see all your friendly faces. Uh, some of you in the audience are actually uh, really close friends and others I haven't met yet, but I appreciate all of you. Um, so I had so much that I wanted to say on this topic, but I have only a very short amount of time. And so in case I do run out of time, I'm going to tell you the end right now. <laughs> <laughs> Fasting goes wrong when you do it too often or for too long. It goes just a little louder, please. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. It goes wrong when you're not getting enough protein or when your body just can't keep up with your energy demands, which can happen even if you're overweight. Um, and it goes wrong when your body is weak or sick or needs to repair and it needs more nutritional support and you're actually giving it less. Okay, so now, now whatever I say is bonus. <laughs> okay, so I w got a lovely introduction, so I don't need to go into this too much. Um, yeah, I've been doing a low-carb diet for more than half my life now. I'm 50, and more than half of that has been carnivore specifically. And I'm not a doctor in any sense of the word, but I do have um, strong academic tendencies. I've been writing papers of various kinds since I was an undergrad and I can't seem to sit still. I like to look at very different things. Um, so as was mentioned, the first time that I spoke about carnivore diets was actually on the low carb cruise in 2017. Um, so I'm really glad to be back here. It feels like coming home in a certain sense. And that summer I also gave carnivore talks at Keto Fest and at Keto Con, and I feel like I really had an opportunity to influence um, thinking in the, in the ketogenic diet community, which has been really great for, for me, <laughs> and I hope for you. <laughs> um, and I got to actually do a carnivore conference of my own that was in 2019, when things started to really pick up, and I felt like there was a lot that people could hear. 2020 put that, uh, to bed for a while, but if there's anyone who thinks that I should do that again, what, yes? <laughs> maybe, maybe I will. Okay, and then um, here are some of the publications that I've been, I've been blessed with the opportunity and the mentorship to be able to actually write papers on ketogenic topics and not just carnivore, if you're interested in some of my other work. Okay, so why do people fast? Does anybody have, want a shout out or autophagy, anything else? It's convenient. <laughs> true, true. It's really cheap. <laughs> also true. Recovery. All right, I wrote down a couple of reasons that often come up. Autophagy is a big one. Um, getting into deeper ketosis, losing weight. Um, maybe faster. Some people talk about uh, reducing inflammation or healing. I'm not going to really spend time on almost any of these, but I will mention that um, all of these things, none of these things do you need to fast for. Uh, no, you don't even need a ketogenic diet to do any of these things. Even ketosis can be done in other ways, right? But a ketogenic diet actually achieves, can achieve all of these things at least as well as fasting, depending on what you're doing. Um, so why would you fast when um, you could do a ketogenic diet and not be not eating? Um, is fasting actually better than a ketogenic diet in any way? Um, have you ever heard the term fasting mimicking diet? No. <laughs> Some people like to call a ketogenic diet a fasting mimicking diet, and I think one of the reasons is because some people want to talk about the benefits of ketosis without being associated with a fat diet. But another reason is just simply that, you know, all of written history happened after we had already transitioned to an agricultural diet. And so the only, you know, by the time we figured out things like what a, a ketone body is or what the mechanism is behind these kinds of diets, um, it normally didn't happen unless you stopped eating entirely. So uh, there were low carb diets, of course, before this past century, but um, it was already considered a kind of weird restricted hack that would mimic not eating. And I think that's a, 
um, not necessarily the, <laughs> the right way of thinking about it, because uh, you can definitely be in ketosis while eating, right? So it turns out that a lot of our scientific knowledge comes from early experiments uh, in the 60s, for example, studying actual starvation, because that was just an easy way to do that. And so we have, this is from Oliver Owens and from George Cahill and other people who are really studying the, the metabolic effects of starvation, which is the ketogenic state. But obviously you can also be in ketosis without being fasted. And while you're, not only are you not fasted, but you're actually in a growth period. So fetuses in the womb are using ketones. The placenta is full of ketone bodies. Um, breastfeeding babies and many other mammals that are in the nursing stage are in this uh, ketogenic state, uh, at least mildly. And then of course, any time throughout childhood or adulthood as a human, you can be fully fed and still be in ketosis. So if you're doing that and you're getting all your energy and your um, nutrition needs met, then you're not facing the dangers that you would have when you're not actually eating. So starvation is not sustainable, right? You're not getting enough energy, you're not getting enough protein, and you're not getting enough nutrients. Energy is the main thing that is the acute problem when you stop eating. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the phases of starvation and what we know about what the body goes through when you stop eating from the point of being on a high carb diet to not eating anything at all. And it's all about where you're getting your energy. So at first you're getting your energy from glucose, then from fat, and then finally as a last resort from protein. So here's that picture again from George Cahill and it's showing what happens in the very first phase of fasting and that's when you're using up everything that's in the bloodstream and then you're depleting your liver glycogen. So all of this time you're still basically on a, a glucose-based metabolism and it's not until a couple of days have passed and all of that gets used up before you start uh, using primarily fat for energy and that's the second phase. So at this point you've run out of carbohydrates to use as a main source. You're still always using some carbohydrate, and of course you're making some. But you can see from the picture that the, your body actually downregulates your, your use of glucose, and it has to. Um, it has to because you need to spare protein. And pro when, when your body starts to mine protein, that's when, you, that's when you're in danger of death, because that's when you're tearing down your actual body structural parts. And so there are many adaptations throughout this, this phase two ketogenic state that are sparing of protein by reducing gl glucose needs. So the big one is of course that you're using ketone bodies for brain fuel. And that adds up to a lot because the brain is an energy hog. And so if you're, even if you're only using 60 or 70% of ketones instead of glucose, that's, that's a big component. And then your muscles start using primarily fat for energy. Um, and that's just uh, something that happens automatically through what fuel is available. When there's a lot of fat in the bloodstream, it, your muscle cells don't take up as much glucose and vice versa. So that's the second way. Um, has anyone ever told you that you can't make sugar from fat, you can make it only from protein? It's not exactly true <laughs> uh, because the, you can get it indirectly. So this is a triglyceride. It's three fatty, fatty acids and they're held together by glycerol. And every time you break up a triglyceride to use those fatty acids, you're left with a glycerol. And glycerol is actually a substrate for gluconeogenesis. So that's convenient. Um, and likewise, actually, there are three ketone bodies. Acetoacetate in the middle is the, like the mother of all ketone bodies. It's made first. It's the only one that can actually be um, metabolized. So we normally measure beta-hydroxybutyrate beta in the blood, and we talk about that one a lot, but it's kind of uh, inert. You have to turn it back into acetoacetate to be able to use it. Um, the other one that is made, we often talk about as if it's a waste product. So there's this spontaneous degradation of acetoacetate happening all the time into acetone, that's the one you measure in your breath. It turns out that acetone can actually be used as a substrate for gluconeogenesis and maybe up to 
10 or 11% of gluconeogenesis, if you're in a very highly ketogenic state, can be used for that. So that's also pretty convenient. So that's the third way. And then there's the Cori cycle, and this is oversimplified, but um, basically when y y your muscles are using mostly fat, but they still need glucose for anaerobic metabolism, and when they do that and they generate ATP, uh, lactate is a metabolite from that, and that can go back into the liver and made into glucose again. And it's not exactly free, because you need to add energy to make the process of turning lactate into glucose, but that ATP can come from fatty acid metabolism. So it's like you've charged the, the glucose battery using fat, and it, so the ATP that that, that muscle is using, um, you can think of as being made by fat. So that's, that's four ways that um, glucose needs can go down and all of that is protein sparing. But there's still gonna be a drain on protein. Like you can't not have protein and survive. And um, even when you have a very high fat availability, there's at least some amount of energy expenditure still coming from protein. You're still gonna have turnover and you're gonna have losses that need to be replaced. Um, it happens to be true that the more fat that you're using, the less your protein needs seem to be. Because if you compare lean animals and obese animals who are in this phase two, um, they, the obese ones will use less protein. And I think that comes from all of that extra um, sparing that I just talked about. And I don't think that's acknowledged very often. Um, so, once fat gets low enough, you go into real like danger zone starvation. It's emergency mode. You don't have enough fat to meet your energy needs, and so your body starts breaking down muscles in a much faster way. Uh, your corticosteroids rise, you get very hungry, um, energy expenditure goes up, and your muscle is getting used. Um, and your death is imminent, basically. And this is a graph from uh, cancer where they're showing that you can see fat use goes up until it doesn't, and then you, you turn to protein for the end stage. But the interesting thing about that is that obese animals don't die of starvation from getting to phase three. And the reason that they don't is because of that slow drain on protein that um, you might not even notice. So. Here's just a quote from a study um, saying, in severe obesity, the slow loss of protein phase, that should be a two, <laughs> may continue until a lethal stage of cumulative protein loss is reached long before the lipid reserves are depleted. So this is a real danger that I think when you're on ketogenic diet for a long time and not getting quite enough protein can be masked and we need to be aware of it. So, the, and the protein loss isn't just coming from your muscles because um, where it comes from is where the turnover is high. So you're always in a process of breaking down uh, muscle tissue and protein tissue and then building it back up. And if what's happening is that you don't have enough new protein to build it back up, then the ones that had the highest turnover are the ones that are going to get the most damage. And that turns out to be things like organs like the heart. And so people who have died from fasting or from inadequate protein typically uh, have cardiac problems. There are very sad stories about um, this happening, for example, the last chance diet, which was supposed to be a kind of protein sparing fast, but in this case in particular, the protein that they were using was um, mostly from gelatin. And so although it had enough protein in terms of grams by having measured like how much protein, how much nitrogen losses should we expect to be making up for, if they're not the right amino acids, it's still not gonna be enough. So let's talk a little bit more about the protein sparing modified fast. Um, does anyone, has anyone heard of a protein sparing modified fast? Mm -hmm. Who thinks that a protein sparing modified fast is a high protein diet? <laughs> Who thinks it's a low protein diet? <laughs> so it's, it's supposed to be an exactly adequate protein diet. 
If it's more than that, it's not a protein sparing modified fast. The whole purpose that it was designed for is to have all the benefits of fasting, but not have that problem of dying from organ failure. <laughs> um, so ideally, you would calculate how much protein that you need, which of course is going to be based on averages and you can't know for sure unless you're measuring your nitrogen losses, and eat that much and nothing else and then ideally you would lose as much weight as possible uh, from fasting without having all of the dangers. So what would it mean if you're on a protein sparing modified fast or even a full fast say and you're still hungry? Has anybody, has anybody gone on a protein sparing modified fast and felt not hungry? I, I would be astonished. Uh, so what does that mean? Not getting enough. So it could be that you're not getting enough protein. What else could it be? Not getting enough energy, right? <laughs> so those are the two main things that we're hungry for. Um, so could you have inadequate energy on a protein sparing modified fast, even if you're obese? Mm -hmm. Why? You've got all that fat on your body. Well, the fat loss is rate limited. So usually when we see someone who is not getting enough energy from being on a fast, it's because they're really, really lean. And so they just don't have the fat mass to support the energy that their bodies need. But a lot of us, even if we have more fat, the rate at which our fat can come off the body just isn't enough to meet all our energy needs and we're still gonna be hungry and we're still gonna have um, the symptoms of inadequate energy or protein. What are some other symptoms of not having enough? How about being tired, lethargy, uh, brain fog, cold, irrit irritability? Hair loss, Hair loss. <laughs> that's getting pretty severe, yeah. So. If you're doing a lot of fasting, the kinds of things to look out for are, are you feeling less good? And if you are, then that's an indication that you're doing too much and you're not supporting your body's needs. Um, so if you're in that situation and you, you are what is on your calculated PSMF, uh, you, you basically have two choices if you wanna stay ketogenic. You can add protein or you can add fat. If you add fat, then this becomes um, basically a high fat diet, right? Because um, then your proportion of fat starts to go up. Um, so as I mentioned before, if you're eating more fat, um, you could actually potentially be reducing your protein needs. Um, I don't have numbers on that and it's controversial. <laughs> but you're definitely um, gonna be improving your bodily function because now you have energy to do the things that your body wasn't able to do before as told by those symptoms, right? Could it reduce fat loss? Well, think about it this way. If, you're, if you need, say, 2,000 calories worth of energy to feel your best and you're on this protein sparing modified fast and you're not feeling your best because you're not getting enough energy because your body's only producing, say, 1,700 calories, and you add 300 calories worth of fat, are you losing less fat? No, you weren't losing it in the first place. All you're doing is providing the fat that you needed to get all the energy needs that you met. So you don't necessarily actually reduce fat loss by eating more fat. Could you increase fat loss by adding fat? That's also a controversial question, but if you think about the way that fat oxidation works, it's steered hormonally. So if you are increased fat ingestion is actually making your body have a lower insulin to gluco glucagon ratio, it could actually speed up fat oxidation such that it's making up for the extra fat that you've put in. It's not impossible that that could actually happen. So if you add fat to your protein sparing modified fast, that kind of looks like phase two of starvation, but you don't have those dangerous protein losses. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about fat fasting, um, but I probably don't have time to do that. Um, let's talk about the other, the other solution, which is add protein. And I know I talk about the high fat solution a lot because it's the underdog, but that doesn't mean that I don't like 
the idea of adding more protein, and sometimes I think it's appropriate. For example, your protein sparing modified fast is calculated by somebody else's averages, and it might actually not be enough protein for you. So if it wasn't enough protein, adding more protein might actually be getting you to adequate, and you should have better results and feel better. If your protein was already adequate and you add more protein, that's where things can get a bit dicey. To a certain degree, and depending on how metabolically healthy you are, it might not matter. Um, but when, at, a, at a certain point, when you keep adding protein to what would be normally a ketogenic diet, you start to go more and more toward glucose mode. Your, your ketosis is reduced. Ketosis is really just a marker of high fatty acid oxidation in a low glucose context. It can raise cortisol, which is not maybe as bad a thing as people like to make it out to be. Cortisol has pros and cons. It's anti-inflammatory, but that is a consequence of eating higher protein. It seems to raise energy expenditure, which could be a benefit for fat loss, depending on if the demands that it's placing on your fat stores are, are able to be met better in that context or not. So it could increase fat loss. Um, it could reduce fat loss. <laughs> um, and it looks a lot more like phase three of starvation, but again, with, without the dangerous protein losses. And I think both of these strategies of adding fat or adding protein can be beneficial for different people. And if, if you're in a position of not getting um, what you need, I think it's warranted to try both. Um, so when does fasting backfire? <laughs> When you do it too often and too long so that your, your body is not getting the nutrients it needs, when you're not getting the energy that you need, and so you're, you're, your body's going to have adaptations, um, your metabolism's going to go down, um, and you, you're probably suffering. <laughs> when you don't get enough protein, which can be not just uncomfortable but fatal, <laughs> and when you don't get enough energy, which can just make your life miserable. Um, and again, this is not something that happens only to people who are extra lean. It can happen to people who have excess fat. A couple of reasons why it might happen when you have a lot of fat, hyperinsulinemia, hyperinsul right? So if you've got fat on your body, but your insulin is very high, the rate at which the fat is gonna come out is gonna be less than someone who's more metabolically healthy. And so you are going to look more functionally lean. A second thing that I think is much more common than we've realized is uh, lipedema, which affects maybe 10% of women. It, it's also something that people are learning a lot about. And with lipedema, you have actually scarred fat tissue. And so that, that fat tissue is not giving up its fat in a healthy way. So um, you might look at yourself and say, why have I got all this fat on me? I'm fasting and it should be just coming right off, but it's not coming off because it's not working tissue. Um, so you need to support yourself, and especially if you're in some kind of condition that is raising your insulin. Insulin can be raised for many reasons, but one of them is that it's actually a part of um, the healing process in inflammation can raise insulin. Inflammation is, an, is another word for healing. <laughs> like it's the body process that happens when you are healing. And insulin gets raised in that context because insulin is a repair and building hormone. And it doesn't care that you want to lose fat. And so that might be a reason why your fat is not coming off your body as much as you want it to. And so if you instead give your body more energy and give it what it needs, then you can become more functional. And then later, maybe when you try to cut calories or uh, do something like that again, maybe you let your body will be in a healthier position to let go of those fat stores. So I would just like you to um, be encouraged to give your body the support that it needs not push yourself too hard. And if you want more specifics, um, I'm not your person, but anyone that spoke today ha would be an excellent choice, I think, to get ideas about how to specifically implement any of these things. Thank you.